Hi, my name is Wei Feng in College of Computer Science and Engineering at Zhejiang University. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about our recent work on multi-stage robust optimization on the indulgence uncertainty with mixed integer records. This work was done when I was a waiting PhD student in Professor Qi Gang's group at the University of Minnesota. Indulgence uncertainty has its origin in stochastic programming. But recently, there is also a lot of effort to adjust it from a robust optimization perspective. Since robust optimization is a site-based approach, considering indulgence uncertainty can be translated as how the uncertainty site changes with the decision. Briefly speaking, there are three types of indulgence uncertainty in the literature. Type 1 can alter the size and the shape of the uncertainty site. In type 2a, decisions determine whether the uncertain parameter materializes. This means whether the uncertain parameter becomes physically meaningful is determined by some decision. Thus, decisions can affect the dimensionality of the uncertainty set. In type 2b, decisions determine whether and when the true value of the uncertain parameter is observed. In our recent paper, we also discuss about the differences of these three types of indulgence uncertainty. For more detail, please see talk number 57HD. First, we focus on the two-stage case before we extend the H to the multi-stage one. In this general formulation, X and Y are our first stage of continuous and binary decisions, respectively. X tilde and Y tilde are second stage decisions, and they are functions of uncertain parameter C. With the arch loss of generality, we apply the deterministic objective function and the constraints have to hold for every possible relation of C within the uncertainty set C. Note that the uncertainty set is formulated as a polyhedron here, which depends on the first stage decision Y. We restrict ourselves to this type of uncertainty set mainly for computational reasons, because this allows us to arrive at a mixed integer linear reformulation. In addition, the C1 is fixed to, to 1 just for notational convenience. Note that this uncertainty set is sufficient to model both type 1 and 2A uncertainty. This is a simple example of decision dependent uncertainty set. There are two uncertainty parameters since the C1 has already been fixed to 1. This uncertainty set depends on two binary variables, which are y1 and y2. If both y1 and y2 are 1, we obtain this uncertainty set. Then, if y1 equals 0 and y2 equals 1, the uncertainty set changes to this one. However, if y1 if y1 is 1 and y2 is 0, the C string is fixed to 0 because of this inequality. In practice, this can be one or two things. Either C string has to be zero when y2 is zero, or what is the more common case is that C string doesn't even materialize if y2 is zero. This means that C string is physically meaningless, so its value is equivalent to a problem. We then just fix it to zero for convenience. Finally, when y1 and y2 are both zero, the uncertainty set is empty, which doesn't make sense. Hence, the solution y equals to zero and y equals zero zero should be infallible. To solve this problem, we apply the decision rule approach based on the concept of lifted uncertainty, which is proposed by Jojo and his co-workers. For those who are not familiar with this technique, the idea is just to place break points into a marginal support of each uncertain parameter to divide it into multiple pieces. Then we introduce additional uncertain parameters for each piece based on these two lifting operators. And these lifting operators map the original uncertain parameter into higher dimensional lifted space. The first operator, which is the L bar here, is essentially a piecewise linear function such that the summation of the lifted uncertain parameters over all pieces is equal to the original uncertain parameter. 
The second operator, which is LHQ, is just a step function depending on the location of base point. Introducing these lifted uncertain parameters allows us to formulate the discontinuous piecewise linear decision rules for continuous recalls and the piecewise constant decision rules for binary recalls. Here, I want to highlight that our decision rule for continuous recalls are not just piecewise linear. Actually, it is discontinuous piecewise linear, which turns out to be very important when there are both continuous and binary recalls. So just to give more intuitions, let's look at this simple example here. Execute one and execute two are our continuous recourse decisions. And the right to one and right to two are our binary recourse decisions. Focus it between one and the thing. Right to one is, the, is one, that allows x to one to be non-little. And the x to two and y to two have to be both little. But if focus A is greater than swing, x tilde 1 and the y tilde 1 have to be below. And the y tilde 2 is, is 1, which allows x tilde 2 to be non little what, So what you can see here is that your decision rule for x tilde 1 and the x tilde 2 should be discontinuous piecewise linear. If we don't have this kind of decision rule, the problem is infeasible, obviously. Many problems of interest have similar issue. So this is really practical, not just for this illustrative example. What I said in the second stage case can be easily extended to a multi-stage case. I want to go into details here, but the only thing I want to note is that the stage-wise uncertainty stage is associated with the latest stage and it depends on all the previous binary decisions. And these binary decisions are also functions of uncertain parameters. Since we apply the linear decision rules, we can still reformulate a problem into a mixed integer linear program. And uh, this can be solved using off the shelf mix solvers. We apply the proposed methodology to two examples. The first one is a two stage problem, which optimizes the design for flexible production. The objective here is to decide which production units to build in order to meet uncertain feature demand. AI is our first stage binary decision, uh, which indicates whether unit I is built or not. Y to the I and the X to the I are our second stage decisions. Y to the I denotes whether to operate unit I, and the X to the I is a corresponding production amount. Then we need to satisfy the demand, which is forced by this constraint. And then these are the capacity constraints. In addition to demand, we also have uncertain production capacity. What I show here is the production cost curve of three different units along with the range of available production amount. And this dashed line here indicates indicate the uncertainty in production capacity. The uncertainty stage for capacity considered here is budget-based. First, we have this fixed uncertainty stage where tau is our budget parameter. Budget it doesn't really reflect the fact that the materialization of capacity uncertainty and the budget actually depend on the selection of units. Since the production capacity uncertainty isn't critically meaningful if we don't build a large unit. So the capacity uncertainty is actually endogenous, which makes the decision dependent on uncertainty stage more appropriate. In this case, we'll consider the uncertainty stage of this form, which depends on the first stage decision lay. We also have the budget tall and the force the uncertainty parameter to be zero if the corresponding lay is zero. Then we compare the objective value using the fixed and the decision dependent on uncertainty set. We solve the problem with different budget tall. You can see that there is a significant difference between the two solutions. This tells us that, uh, that modeling endogenous uncertainty actually reduces the conservatism in the solution. Since this example only has three units, we can also obtain the analytical solution easily. It also shows that we can recover the analytical solution using our decision rule based approach. In addition, 
the computational performance strongly depends on the choice of breakpoint. Larger number of breakpoints generally lead to better solution at a cost of increased model size and higher degree of symmetry. You can see that your solution improves with more breakpoints and of course the, the computation time also increases. So what we can do here is to try to be a bit smarter about how to place the breakpoint. In fact, we can leverage some problem specific features. In this case, one can imagine that the cost decisions may change once the demand reaches the lower or upper bound of the production range of a unit. So we use these numbers as a breakpoint. Then we have less instance using less breakpoint, but obtain the same optimal solution in much less computation time. The second example here is a multi period production planning problem. Again, the demand and the production capacity are our uncertain parameters, but the sequential decision making process is more complex. Before the beginning of scheduling horizon, we have the option to upgrade some of the production units. So, li i is one if unit i is upgraded, and it also changes the uncertainty set for the capacity. Then, at the beginning of period one, we observe the demand of this period before we decide which unit to run. We assume that once we run the unit, we can observe its capacity. Based on that, we can determine how much we need to produce, how much we have to purchase externally, and what's the related inventory. This repeats itself until the end of the scheduling horizon. Then I want to emphasize the benefits of binary code. Here is a problem with three units that can be upgraded and the price of equipment upgrade scales with the parameter gamma bar. We saw multiple instances with different gamma bar and the shed of each circle reflect, reflects which production units are upgraded. You can see that we by increasing the cost of upgrade, we perform less upgrades until a point where we don't perform any upgrade. The top line represents a solution with only continuous cost, while the bottom one indicates a solution with both continuous and binary cost. One can see that one can see that there is a significant cost reduction that is larger than 35% if the binary cost is considered in addition to the continuous one. However, adding binary cost also increases the computational cost. Here we solve the problem with different number of time periods. Again, once with only continuous recourse and another time with both continuous and binary recourse. You can see that your computation time increases by two orders of magnitude if we add the binary recourse. This is not only because this is not only because additional binary records certainly increase its model size, but also probably due to the loose bounds since our reformulation includes many big M constraints. So this is a big downside of this reformulation based approach. Finally, let me just conclude with some brief summary. The key takeaway here is that there is significant benefit from proper modeling of endogenous uncertainty and mixed integer reports. We also propose a decision rule based approach with polyhedral, de with polyhedral decision dependent uncertainty set and the finally reformulate the problem into a mixed integer linear program. But there are still some computational limitations for industrially relevant problems. We need to develop more efficient solution methods to make it more practical. Thanks for listening. Here is a preprint of our work, which is available on archive. I'll be happy to take any questions. You can email us at either of the two email addresses. Thank you so much.